the screen. Okay. Hi, okay. everyone. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest, Professor Hart. Professor Hart is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor at Harvard University. He is the 2016 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, and his research centers on the roles that ownership structure and contractual arrangements play in the governments and boundaries of corporations. He has been president of the American Law and Economics Association and a vice president of the American Economic Association. Now, it is truly my honor to welcome our guest, Professor Hart. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Zunian. So now, can you see my slides now? Can you see my slides? Uh, Zunian, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't think so. No. Okay, so we have to go back to... Because um... it says right now you can... Oh, here we are. Okay. Perfect. All right. You perfect. can now, right? Yep, perfect. All right. Okay, well, thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk for about 35 minutes, I think, and then take some questions. Um, so recently I have been working on the topic of corporate social responsibility. Um, and just to, to sort of introduce it, the, the, the question is, um, whether corporations, companies have a social responsibility, and if so, what is it? Um, I'm thinking here of large companies, so-called public companies, uh, whose, trade, whose shares are traded on uh, the stock market, you know, so you can think of Amazon or Microsoft or Exxon, et cetera. Um, these are also companies that many of us are invested in or will be. In your case, maybe it's will be. I don't know whether you already are. But certainly as you get older, you will find yourself um, investing in these companies, if only uh, through your, your pensions, um, because then you, know, you put, side of money, uh, you put uh, money aside and you um, uh, often people put it in index funds which means they hold a little piece of, of every American company, including these big ones. Uh, obviously a very small amount, but you'll, you'll still be invested in, in them. Certainly I am, and I, uh, I'm expecting your teachers are. Um, okay, before I go further, let me make it clear that all my work in this area is co-authored. And if you're uh, interested to learn more, you can go to my website, just Google me at uh, Harvard, and um, these are some of the papers I've written. Um, all three are with, Lu with Luigi Zingales, who is at um, uh, Univ University of Chicago Booth uh, Business School, and one of them is with Eleonora Brocada, who's at the University of Trento. Um, as I say, all on my website. Okay, I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. So the first part is the question. Um, do companies have a social responsibility? And if so, what is it? Um, a very simple and striking answer to this question was provided uh, over 50 years ago by Milton Friedman, a very famous economist, in an article he wrote uh, in the, uh, for the New York Times. It appeared in the magazine, the Sunday magazine. Quite surprising um, that that was the case. I don't think you see too many articles like that now. Um, his answer is encapsulated in the in the title of the article, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profit. So this is obviously a, a sort of title that shocks people um, because it makes it sound as if greed is good. But uh, that wasn't really quite Friedman's position. Um, Friedman recognized that there are social problems in the world, but he thought these were best solved by governments and individuals not by for-profit companies. Um, his, his basic view was that companies should make as much money as possible for their owners, that is the shareholders, distribute this money, and then um, the shareholders can use their increased wealth to do good in the world if they want, or you know, if they're selfish, they'll spend it on themselves. If they're um, charitable, they will uh, give to charity. And his basic point was it uh, makes more sense 
for each shareholder to give to his or her favorite charity rather than having a company do it on their behalf. And stated that way, the proposition uh, is hard to disagree with, and it has been uh, hugely influential in the thinking of economists, lawyers, people in finance, practitioners over the last 50 years. Um, I think this is unfortunate because there's a slight problem with Friedman's argument. It's uh, in general wrong. And let me explain why. Um, and I'll be talking more about this in a few minutes. Um, consider a company that can at some cost clean up its operations, um, thus avoiding pollution, for example, carbon emissions, so it could reduce its carbon footprint. And let's assume um, the law does not require it to do this. So Friedman's view then is that the company should not clean up because that would re you know, reduce it, its, its profit. It would have to incur this cost. Um, but consider a socially minded shareholder, um, the kind of person that Friedman had in mind who gives to charity or puts solar, solar panels on their house, buys free range chicken. Um, such a person might prefer the company to clean up even though this will lower their dividend. Uh, why might they prefer that? Remember that, sorry. Um, remember they're socially minded. So the alternative is for the company not to clean up to pollute and they get a higher dividend, right? But, um, you know, because they care about things like pollution, what are they going to do with that dividend? Well, um, they could clean up the mess. But first of all, you know, there's a big coordination problem between the shareholders, who's going to do the cleaning. But even more fundamental, the cost of cleaning up the pollution um, may far exceed the profit which was earned by polluting in the first place. In other words, it may be more efficient just not to pollute than to, have to pollute and clean up that may be highly inefficient. So um, the difference here between charity and pollution, this is where I think the Friedman's argument goes wrong, is that in the case of charity, companies have no comparative advantage in, in, in giving to charity um, relative to individuals. But when it comes to pollution, it's different. A company does have a comparative advantage in avoiding pollution, simply because, just to repeat, um, if they pollute and then uh, shareholders are, are forced to clean it up, that can be hugely inefficient, right? There's no inefficiency in individuals giving to charity um, as opposed to companies, but there is when it comes to um, uh, causing and cleaning up pollution. Now, before I go on, I want to make it clear that um, in I'm going to be talking about how companies can be pressured by shareholders to behave more responsibly, not to uh, cause pollution. Um, but I don't want uh, you to think for a moment that I believe that companies can solve all our social problems. Uh, government's crucial, and particularly when it comes to pollution, particularly when it comes to climate change, we're not going to solve that problem just by having companies behaving better. And like most economists, I think the right way to deal with climate change is to have uh, so-called Piguvian tax after the economist Arthur Pigu. Um, in this case, that would mean a carbon tax. Um, a worldwide carbon tax set at the right rate. There's, of course, some disagreement about what that rate should be. I think that is the ideal um, way forward, but it's very hard to actually get to that because uh, carbon taxes are a hard sell politically, even within a country, let alone um, to have all countries agree to the right carbon tax. You need the coordination between different national governments. That's extremely hard to achieve. And we haven't seen too much progress in that direction. So given that governments aren't solving the problem, I think companies have a role to play. And that's what I'm talking about uh, today. Now, before we go on to part two, um, I wanna take a short pause and ask, um, you know, I've been talking about people being socially minded, socially responsible as shareholders. Um, and some people ask, you know, is this really true? Are shareholders uh, socially uh, responsible? And some people react, they, re they think the answer is no, because they have in mind the, the, the largest shareholders these days who are institutions, institutions like Vanguard and BlackRock and Fidelity. Uh, and they own, you know, about uh, to get the, the big three own um, about uh, over 20% of 
um, every American a company uh, with, who's, uh, that is publicly traded. And so, you know, you think of these institutions, they seem sort of impersonal. Um, they don't seem to have a, a conscience. But um, what you have to, should bear in mind is that behind, have in mind is that behind these institutions are individuals. I mean, who puts their money with the institutions? Who in their, uh, the institutions then invest in the companies? Well, the answer is it's people like me and you, or at least the future you. It's just ordinary people. And that's who I have in mind. Those are the people who I think, I think you and I um, are probably somewhat socially responsible. I hope so. Um, we, we care about other things than money and we care about other things than ourselves. Okay, so the answer I think is yes. At the, at, if you go behind everything to the, the, the ultimate shareholders, um, they are likely to be socially responsible. Okay, now, um, part two. Um, given that socially minded shareholders might be willing to sacrifice some profit for the greater good, again, going back to my pollution example, they might actually prefer the company um, to pay a lower dividend and avoid the pollution. Um, how can they push companies to do that kind of thing? Um, are there are two mechanisms. Um, which in one of our papers that I, uh, you know, in the, in the earlier slide, uh, we call voice and exit. In fact, the title of our paper is Exit versus Voice. This, uh, some of you may have come across the writings of um, Hirschman, and he uh, has a book which has exit and voice in the title. Um, so we're just using that language. So what do I mean by those things? Well, voice, by voice, I mean, um, the following, shareholders are in a unique position relative to other stakeholder groups. So you'll often, you, these days, you, you hear a lot of talk about stakeholders. Um, who are the stakeholders? Well, they, are, uh, they include the shareholders, but they also include workers, consumers, the local community. Well, the difference between these groups is that shareholders have votes. Um, uh, they have the power to elect the board of directors, uh, to put up shareholder resolutions and vote on them. The other constituencies do not. They can be active in other ways, but they don't have any voting power. And so when I talk about voice here, I'm referring to that mechanism. Shareholders using their voting power to get companies to do what they want. Um, and I want to compare that to exit. What, what does exit mean? Exit means um, getting out of companies that you don't like. So in the case of shareholders, it would be divestment. Shareholders um, saying, you know, this is a dirty firm. I don't like that. I'm going to sell my shares and be, be rid of the firm. Or in the case of consumers, it would mean consumers saying, I don't want to buy the product of dirty firms. Or workers saying, I don't want to work for dirty firms. So these are exit strategies. And exit strategies get more attention um, than voice strategies. Another uh, term for voice would be engagement. So engaging with management as opposed to simply shunning the company. But as I say, exit strategies, uh, shunning strategies get more attention. And um, if I take my own university, Harvard, um, the Harvard students have advocated for exit and have managed to persuade uh, Harvard University to do it. So Harvard University, uh, uh, not so long ago, announced that it was going to get out of oil companies, for example. It's just simply going to sell its shares over time. So um, I'm going to argue this is actually the wrong strategy. And uh, staying with the dirty companies and using your voice or um, and engage with engaging with management and and persuading them to. Um, become, to do better, to become cleaner, is a better strategy than simply getting out, uh, simply exiting. Um, so I want to start, um, here we get into the more serious analysis, I'm going to give you uh, an example of how voice can work. And I'm going to use a real world, exa real world example to illustrate this. So um, we go back a little bit in time. In 1984, DuPont, the um, uh, chemical company faced a choice between polluting the Ohio River with a toxic substance known as PFOA or avoiding the pollution by, by incinerating the substance. Okay, this was by the way in, in it was, uh, this was uh, happening because they were making a Teflon. 
uh, Teflon frying pans, this kind of thing, um, which you're probably too young to recall, but that was um, the rage at the time. And, but then it unfortunately had this byproduct of this toxic substance. Now, um, um, the next, next bullet point, point kind of gives, gives the game away, away as to what they did. They, uh, because there was a court case eventually, and of course that could have only happened if they didn't incinerate, if they decided to dump the stuff in the, in the Ohio river. And that's exactly what they did now. Um, so eventually, uh, this sub, this, um, uh, waste that was dumped um, created uh, health problems for the people living um, beside the Ohio River. Uh, people got ill, some people died um, of cancer and that kind of thing. And um, uh, so eventually there was litigation, but it took a very long time. Uh, it was very circuitous. And at the end of the day, um, DuPont didn't really have to pay that much. But um, because it went to court, um, one of the advantages of that is a lot of information becomes available. And one of my co-authors, uh, Luigi Zingales, together with uh, somebody else, they wrote a paper where they used the court case documents to come up with some estimates of first the cost of incineration. What would it, what would it have cost DuPont to avoid uh, dump, you know, the pollution? Um, answer, $90 million. Um, this is the, the the cost over time, present value back to 1984. So these are 1984 dollars, not 2022 dollars. You obviously have to multiply up by quite a bit to get to current money. Um, they can also estimate the um, the social cost of um, not incinerating, in other words, of dumping the waste. Um, they do that by um, coming up with some value of health. So if people get ill, you can sort of come up with a ways to compute the cost of that to them. And also, you know, you can, you can people die. Um, economists come up with um, the value of, of life and you can multiply that by the number of people who die. And if you add it all up, you get $350 million, again, in 1984 dollars. That's a present value of future uh, illness and the, the harm of illness and uh, the, the cost of that and of death discounted back to 1984. Okay, so you have these two numbers, 19 and 350. Well, obviously, uh, 19 is a lot less than 350. So um, I'm sure uh, any of you are doing, who are doing economics are familiar with cost benefit analysis. A social planner looking at that would say, obviously, the right thing to have done was incinerate. Um, but um, as I said, that's not what um, DuPont did. Now, what do, I, what do I want to imagine is suppose shareholders could have made that decision rather than DuPont management. It was never put to the shareholders, but suppose it had been, and suppose they could have simply voted on what to do. Well, um, using today's numbers, um, think of an investor who has a half a million dollars, this is now 2022 dollars, invested in the US stock market. And let's suppose they hold an index fund, a fully diversified portfolio. Um, and notice we're talking about someone who's obviously not poor. They have half a million dollars, but they're not super rich either. They're somewhere in the middle. Um, such a person would own approximately 10 to the minus eighth of the total US stock market. So as I say, I'm assuming they have a fully diversified portfolio indexed across all American stocks. Um, 10 to the minus eight, that's one over a hundred millionth. So that means that this person owns one over a hundred millionth of each US company, publicly traded company, including DuPont, okay? So if they were voting on this, uh, imagine, you know, you're the, this person and you're, you're trying to, you're deciding how to vote. Well, um, if you're gonna vote at all, which I'm, assume you, I'm gonna assume you're willing to do, you may as well vote for the outcome you want. Right, because the only time your vote matters is if you're pivotal. Highly unlikely uh, that you will be pivotal, but it's the only time your vote matters. So you may as well vote. You know, if I was pivotal, um, which outcome? You know, my vote's going to determine the outcome. So I may as well choose the outcome I want. Okay, how to think about those two different outcomes? Well, incineration. If the outcome is incineration. Um, the company is going to incur this cost of 90 million, 
But you only own a hundred, one over a hundred millionth of the company. So 19 million over a hundred million is 19 cents. That is the personal capital loss you would take if the company decides to incinerate, or another way to think of it, that's your dividend will be 19 cents lower than it otherwise would have been. Um, what about now, in contrast to that, there's a gain to society. So, you know, you are out of pocket 19 cents. What about everybody else? Well, there's your fellow shareholders who incur a cost of 19 million. And let's suppose you care about them. Uh, of course, minus your 19 cents, right? Your everything but your nine. Well, we can forget about that. It's basically they are going to be out by 19 million, but then all the people um, living uh, by the Ohio River are going to have a gain of 350 million because of the um, illness and death avoided. So uh, plus 350 minus 19 is 331 million. So the way to think about it is. Are you willing to give up 19 cents of your own money for a net social gain enjoyed by everybody else of $331 million? Well, I ask you, I ask myself and I ask you, how many people would not be willing to give up 19 cents? Well, of course, we are talking about um, 1984 cents. So, you know, maybe multiply by 10, but it's still $1.90. It's not uh, a lot. And for this enormous a social gain. How many people wouldn't be willing to make that trade-off? I think very few. And so what I'm suggesting to you is if this had been put to a vote, um, the majority um, would have voted to incinerate, um, which is, of course, not what um, DuPont did. So um, the conclusion I draw from this is that if companies listen to their shareholders and actually ask them what they want the company to do rather than blindly maximizing profit, as Friedman suggested, uh, they may end up behaving in a much more socially responsible way, deciding to incinerate not as opposed to deciding not to. Okay, so that I hope shows you with a very simple example how voice, if it's allowed to be heard, if shareholders can make decisions or can communicate to management what they want management to do that you can get a, a good outcome and that the Friedman outcome may, may be much worse. Now, uh, remember, I was saying, you know, there's voice, there's also exit. Let's consider how exit would worse, work here. Um, so suppose you know, put a voice aside, suppose that um, shareholders decide, you know, the way we're going to influence uh, DuPont is by divesting. So in fact, what they basically uh, imagine the following, DuPont management has made a provisional decision um, to dump, and now 10% of DuPont's uh, most responsible, uh, let's say the most responsible shareholders, 10% of them, uh, announce that they're going to sell their shares unless DuPont changes its mind. Okay, now if other investors cannot adjust their portfolios, then um, of course uh, share, the sh uh, DuPont share price is simply going to drop um, through the floor to zero because, you know, there's some people selling and nobody's buying. And so the price will just go down, down, down and um, until it hits zero. And of course, DuPont management presumably would be pretty alarmed by this. They probably own shares or they have stock options. This is very bad news for them. And they will uh, react by uh, changing their decision and uh, announcing they're going to incinerate. Um, so this would be great if it was the end of the story, but it's not the end of the story because, of course, other investors can adjust their portfolios. And the less socially responsible among them will do so since uh, DuPont shares are now a steal. Why are they a steal? Well, uh, DuPont is not, in, has announced it's not going to incinerate, so there's no $19 million charge. Uh, DuPont is just as profitable, in other words, as before, but its prices, the share price is going down, down, down. So these less responsible people will jump in and buy up the shares. And, you know, this is what happens. So, you know, the Financial Times not so long ago reported that hedge funds are scooping up the shares of oil companies uh, dumped by um, people like Harvard. And so, of course, all this activity by uh, the less uh, the less scrupulous um, uh, hedge funds uh, is going to drive the price of shares back up again. And in plausible cases, 
uh, you can show that the price rise will be enough um, such that a value maximizing manager of DuPont will uh, not change uh, their strategy. They'll just decide to uh, you know, continue with um, no incineration. How can you show that? Well, you, uh, this is, I'm talking about theoretically. If you look at the paper exit versus voice, we have a simple model and we are able to calibrate and show this. And what we are able to show, and unfortunately I can't really convey um, uh, much intuition here. You have to look at the paper um, to, to find the details. Um, but what we show is that divestment will not lead um, DuPont management to change its mind unless uh, essentially all investors are willing to give up 19 cents for a $4.7 social gain. Okay, this is hugely different from the uh, conclusion about voice. Remember the conclusion about voice was that if we had an up or down vote, um, the, majority, we would, the majority outcome would be incineration as long as um, a majority of investors are willing to give up 19 cents for a social gain of $331 million. In contrast, for divestment to work, you need, now it's not a majority, you need essentially all investors uh, to be willing to give up. It's not 19 cents versus $331 million. It's 19 cents for a $4.7 social gain. That's obviously hugely more onerous, that requirement. And indeed, uh, it's unlikely to be met because, you know, there, I think there are a lot of people who are not willing to give up 19 cents for a mere measly $4.7 social gain. So this is just showing you, but as I say, unfortunately, I can't really, um, you know, give you, you, you have to look at the pay for the details. Uh, the result is that um, exit is much more demanding. It's much less likely to work than voice. Okay, um, moving on then, sorry. Um, qualifications. Today, as I sort of already indicated, most stocks in the USA are owned through mutual funds. So the big three are Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. In other words, people don't the, anymore these days, most people don't invest in uh, a DuPont directly. They hold a mutual fund at, at Vanguard, which invests in DuPont. And um, the voting is done by the institutions, not by the individual investors. That's just the way it works. And most institu institutions take the view that um, they have a fiduciary duty to their investors. A fiduciary duty means a duty of loyalty, and they, and they do have that. That's true. But they take the view that that duty requires them to always act in a way that maximizes financial return just money. Okay, long run financial return rather than short run financial return, but nonetheless, financial return. And by the way, uh, when it comes to pension money, this is actually a legal requirement. It's in the law with, it's called ERISA, that law, which says that um, uh, trustees have a duty to only focus on financial return. Um, I mean, to the exclusion of everything else. In other cases, non-pension money, there's more flexibility, but most uh, institutions still think that they should uh, just be looking at monetary returns. So that suggests to my co-authors and me that if they were, you know, if we had that up or, or, or down vote on incineration, they would have to vote not to incinerate. Why? Because um, you know, incineration involves this extra cost of 19 million, which is going to eat into financial return. Okay, so my co-authors and I think this makes no sense. We think fiduciary duty should mean, it means duty of loyalty. It should mean doing what your investors, which are the ultimate shareholders, what they want, okay? And I gave in my example, I, you know, where I argued that a majority would give up 19 cents for $331 million. Surely that means that the institution who holds their, uh, you know, who's investing on their behalf, who's holding the shares in uh, DuPont on their behalf, um, should vote uh, to incinerate. At the very least, it should find out, instead of blindly assuming that. Um, the people investing with the institution want them to maximize financial return. It should find out from them what they want. Okay, that's what we think. And um, how could this happen? So 
at least three approaches are possible. The first one is uh, to push down the voting decision to the level of the individual investors. In other words, rather than having Black Vanguard or BlackRock doing the voting for us, and usually we haven't a clue how they're voting, uh, we're, we're sort of ignorant, we're, we're, we're in the dark. Um, it's, what they could do is they could say, you know what, Oliver, you do the voting. We're not going to, we're getting out of the voting business. Um, and indeed, there are some signs of this. BlackRock has uh, done this with its um, largest investors. So um, the largest investors in BlackRock actually are other institutions like the New York State Common Retirement Fund. Okay, so that's obviously retirement money. It invests in the BlackRock S&P 500 ETF, exchange traded fund. And in, in now it has the right to vote pro rata the shares it indirectly owns in all the S&P 500 companies, um, rather than having BlackRock do it. Now, of course, there's a question, New York State Common Retirement Fund should itself be asking its investors how they would like it to vote. So this is only, you know, it's one small step in the right direction, but it's not going that far. And the other problem is, although this strategy pushing down the voting might work well for um, the biggest investors, it's unreasonable um, to expect individual shareholders like me or you um, to do a lot of voting because there are a lot of companies we are investing in through our index funds. Uh, you know, there are about, let's say, 4,000 companies um, whose shares are publicly traded in, in the US. And, um, you know, they, they all have annual meetings and, and, and uh, votes are taken. And so, uh, you know, that's like, if you think about it, 365 days in the year, that's more than 10 uh, votes a day. Well, you know, we have other things to do. We can't really, really be expected to be focusing on that. So that seems like, well, that could be a major problem, but there is a solution, which is today many institutional investors by proxy, proxy, by the way, when I talk about proxy, proxy statements are the things you get basically with the, the things you have to vote on, okay, from the companies. And um, many institutional investors buy proxy advising services um, customized to specific needs. So for example, um, ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, which is one of the big two um, proxy advising firms, um, has uh, six sets of specialty proxy voting guidelines, uh, each geared towards a specific special interest group. So they will have one on labor, uh, one on um, sustainability or climate. Uh, they have faith-based uh, guidelines. So, you know, for example, if you're a Catholic, you uh, might be voting on social issues in a certain way, and you can just pick that guideline um, in advance, and you can say, I want um, my shares to be voted according to this guideline, and then you've sort of delegated the voting to somebody else who presumably will do what you want. I mean, there's a question about that, but let's assume they're honest. They'll do what you want. They will vote in the way you want, and then you don't have to think about it anymore, and you get back to your day job or, you know, go to school or whatever you're doing. Um, uh, okay, so that would seem to be a way of taking the burden off individuals. Um, the second strategy would be for uh, these mutual funds, these intermediaries uh, like BlackRock, et cetera, to elicit investors' preferences and then um, cast the votes based on an aggregation of these preferences. So, for example, they could ask people, um, okay, um, are you willing to give up 19 cents um, personal money for a $331 million um, social gain? Presumably the answer is yes. What about 19 cents for a $1,000 social gain? Well, maybe some people drop out at that point. Um, 19 cents for a $100 social gain, 19 cents for a whatever I had, 4.7 was it? You can find out um, you know, where people um, um, are indifferent and you could use that information in the future when there's a social issue, you would have to do a you know, a calculation of the, the costs and the benefits, but then you know how many people are willing to uh, make that trade off and how many aren't, and you could vote according to that. Um, that's a possibility. Um, there's a problem with that, which uh, those of you who study economics may have come across the idea of incentive compatible mechanisms, or to put it another way, the possibility that people won't tell the truth when you're asked about trade-offs you're willing to make. Maybe you'll lie because you want to 
um, this, you know, get an outcome um, which is more favorable to you. You want BlackRock to vote in a certain way, so you may exaggerate um, uh, how much you're willing to, to give up for the social good, or you may do the opposite. Um, but there may be, um, you know, people have studied um, mechanisms that uh, avoid uh, dissembling, and that it may be possible to uh, find one which will solve the problem here. The third strategy is for mutual fund, for the intermediaries to offer funds with a clear voting strategy, which is uh, announced in advance. So in other words, um, you put your money in a, an index fund, which has said, we are going to be pushing companies to be more, uh, to be greener. Let's say that's a, you know, within limits, but they might actually specify how far they're willing to go in some way. And so you can decide, you know, I like that idea. Um, that's the way I would vote myself if I could, but I don't want to spend my time thinking about it. So I'll just put my money with a fund which is going to engage with management in, in a way that I find appealing. And some examples of this are actually happening. Um, one of them is um, a fund called Vote, which was set up by, which has been set up by uh, engine number one, which had a big victory uh, in getting three people um, um, elected to Exxon Mobil's board. Um, not the vote fund, but engine number one, a small hedge fund had this victory and then set up a vote fund, which is a, a fund which, which promises to engage management in, in, uh, and in a way that pushes them to be, um, redu you know, reduce their carbon footprint, this kind of thing, the companies. Okay, um, I don't want to spend much more time. So let me just end. Um, by with some evidence that voice works a bit fast. So uh, some evidence that voice is um, becoming louder. People are engaging more with management. So here are some shareholder resolutions um, that were uh, voted on in 2021 and that got majority support, um, which used to be very unusual. So in the past, shareholder resolutions uh, typically got uh, very little support. So th this is shareholders asking management to do something, and then it's voted on. And as I say, uh, usually in the past, there was little, very little um, interest in these proposals, but that's changed. Here's one. Um, it involves DuPont again, but we're not going back to 1984. This is a current thing. 81% of DuPont shareholders approved a, a proposal requiring the company to disclose how much plastic it releases in the environment. So, you know, DuPont is at it again. This time it's not dumping stuff into the Ohio River, but it is um, producing a lot of plastic waste and maybe it could clean it up. So the shareholders want some information about that. Um, here's another one. 64% of ExxonMobil shareholders approved a proposal requiring the company to, dis to, to uh, describe its lobbying activities, particularly with respect to the Paris Climate Agreement, um, uh, the goals of that. So, you know, there's a concern that ExxonMobil, an oil company, is actually trying to um, uh, discourage a regulation uh, car, the kind of carbon tax I was talking about earlier, and it's lobbying against those kinds of things. And the share, this might be good for the bottom line of ExxonMobil, but ExxonMobil shareholders, uh, first of all, they're invested in other companies as well. And second, they're, they're citizens of the world, and maybe they don't want you know, a very hot climate, so they're um, perhaps suspicious of this lobbying and they want some more information about it. Um, here we have a majority of Duke Energy shareholders um, requesting uh, uh, disclosures on, on, here we're talking about political contributions, uh, which also, uh, you know, may be going to the quote, wrong people from the point of the shareholders. Um, they're not sure that the company is actually behaving in their interest with respect to these political contributions. 95% of Wendy shareholders approved a re proposal requiring the company um, to disclose um, how it is uh, treating its workers, basically, with respect to COVID. Some concern there that they're not uh, treating them very well. Here we have a picture. Uh, so this is a little more systematic, the evidence here. Um, you have three uh, graphs here. Uh, the green one is average support for uh, ESG, that's environmental, social, and governments, um, resolutions with a political 
uh, of a political nature. Um, the red one is uh, those of a social nature and the blue ones are those of an environmental nature. And you can see they're all trending upwards. So this is uh, the vertical axis is the average support for these proposals. Um, and the horizontal axis is time. And you can see back in you know, 2000, there wasn't much activity um, and it's grown. OK, on all fronts, although, you know, there's a dip down of the environmental um, in the last year. And that's because some of the institutions um, are getting scared of supporting these things because they're getting uh, backlash from um, Republican um, states, uh, governors and, 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 and the like. And um, so they get it, you know, they're backing off. But I, I, I think the important thing is the general trend is upwards. So let me just leave you. I'm going to stop now, but just say that um, one of the, the bottom lines of this, perhaps the main bottom line, is that um, engagement, coming back to, you know, what I was talking about a little bit earlier, it, when it comes to exit versus voice, voice can be much more effective. And I think, um, you know, uh, we should be, we should be engaged instead of just getting out of the dirty companies and um, getting out of the dirty companies. So, you know, if you get out of the dirty companies as a shareholder, who's going to be left as the shareholders of those companies? People who are less socially responsible than you, who may actually push the companies to be even dirtier. Better to stay with those companies and push them to be cleaner. I think that's the way forward and that can actually um, help to achieve a better world. Um, okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great presentation about social responsibility and the importance of shareholder voice, Professor Hart. Um, so now we will open it up to some questions. Uh, I have a question. Okay, uh, hi, Professor Hart. So as I was doing some research on your work earlier, I came across a uh, Business Insider inter interview in 2018 where you talked about smart contracts still being like a long way from solving the, prob uh, the problems. So like now in 22, um, I did a little online digging and I've noticed that you are, I think the senior advisor to uh, Prism Group, which is in my to my knowledge is like an economic consulting firm that designs like um, companies building blockchain platforms or something like that. So I guess this leads up to my question. So my question is from 2018 to now, what has happened in the world of blockchain that has made you believe that maybe your research is now applicable to the functions of that particular design? Or I guess, what have you learned about like Bitcoin or blockchain recently to change your perceptive uh, or your perception about the functionality of these contracts? Okay, well, it's an excellent question. It's not about my talk, of course, but that's all right. Um, I don't think I have changed my position, actually. I mean, I'm a senior advisor, yes. Um, I don't have, you know, I, 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 I provide advice if called on. The, 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 that prism was set up by a former student of mine, Kathy Barrera, so that's why I'm involved with it. But um, I, I haven't changed my uh, blockchain. The, the question I think you're asking is, uh, can blockchain um, be used to um, improve on contracts and to improve on contractual relationships? And I think... Um, I felt from the beginning, and I still feel that it it can help with some very um, simple uh, contract. Well, simple. I mean, simple economic relationships, sort of what economists call uh, spot relationships or kind of short-term relationships. So, um, you know, if I want um, uh, insurance against some event occurring, okay, and um, blockchain can help in ensuring that if the event occurs, so I mean, I, an example I sometimes give is, you know, suppose you're taking a flight and you want insurance um, against your flight being late because you have something very important at the other end. Uh, so slightly fanciful, but you know, something like that could be tr the case. Um, so, you know, in the past, um, you could have an insurance contract, you know, a, com a contract with an insurance company uh, of that kind, but, um, the, the the paperwork required to um, to um, get everything to work would be quite big. I mean, in the sense that if your flight is late, you would have to prove to the insurance company your flight was late, and then 
they, you know, you'd submit a claim with some evidence, they'd have to check the evidence. Eventually you might get, you. let's assume you get the money, but it would all take a lot of time. With blockchain, these things can be automated. So they, uh, you know, the very, as soon as the flight is declared late, some um, that information can, can, be can be conveyed automatically. And then automatically some Bitcoin moves from the insurance company's account to your account. So it all becomes, the transaction cost is reduced. Um, so that could be good. Um, I am myself, in my work on contracts, I'm more interested in long-term relationships, you know, between co two companies that have, a, you know, a multi-year relationship. And for that kind of thing, where it's important actually to have good relations between the two sides, I don't think automating the transaction is really going to do anything. I think it's much more important that we make sure that we agree about what reasonable outcomes are when something happens um, outside what the contract said. So I, you know, a lot of my work has been on incomplete contracts. So in any long-term relationship, it's very hard to anticipate all the many things that can happen. I think the most important thing is that for you and me to agree on how we're going to resolve um, what should happen when uh, one an unanticipated, you know, something like the pandemic occurs or a, a war in Russia, you know, we didn't write that into the contract, what should happen in such a situation. So it's important that we can sort out an outcome that we both think is reasonable. and. Blockchain is, I think, uh, completely useless for that kind of thing. So, in other words, short, a long answer. I, I haven't really changed my perspective. I think um, this new technology can be useful, but only in quite limited uh, situations. Thank you so much, Professor Hart. Um, so, if anyone else has any questions. Okay, so I have a question. Um, yeah, I, go ahead. Jimmy. Yes, yes, please, Zach. Yep. So when money is frozen, sorry, once again, I need to get my other computer. You can go for now. Okay. Um, so the investor Philip Fisher once famously said, uh, "The stock market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything, but the value of nothing." Uh, which kind of ties in well to the notion that like price and profits aren't really everything when it comes to maximizing shareholder value and, for that matter, societal uh, welfare. So what do you think should be the government standpoint in all of this? The government, the, what, sorry, what should be the? The like public policy standpoint for maximizing shareholder welfare or um, societal welfare. Well, first of all, I don't really agree with what, so what you're suggesting, what that quote suggests is that people who invest in the stock market only care about money, right? Yeah, so that's what it suggests. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm suggesting that's false because people invest in the stock market are people. <laughs> and people uh, don't, most people don't care only about money. So the idea that they sort of are schizophrenic, which some people think they are, that when it comes to the stock market, you know, they put on their money hat. But then when it comes to their personal lives, uh, they put on uh, another hat, right? Um, in a way, that's what Friedman was sort of suggesting was right, that it was efficient to be only about money when it comes to your investments and about other things when um, you know, in the rest of your life. I'm, I'm suggesting that dichotomy uh, just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, uh, to give another example, um, I can't see you anymore, but um, to give another example, um, you know, think of Harvard University and how it invests. And suppose it's voting on a um, some resolution or actually people on the board. So, but take a resolution which would be um, to um, reduce Exxon Mobil's lobbying activity. So that might reduce the share price of Exxon Mobil, which might make Harvard. Um, uh, poorer, right? And it might have less money to spend on, you know, what it does, uh, getting students to, you know, um, reducing tuition fees to students. So it, 
I think a lot of people have taken the view Harvard's job is to, you know, it's a great university. It should be encouraging people to come to Harvard. It should be carrying, encouraging um, less well-off people to come to Harvard. So it wants to be as wealthy as possible so it can do that. But actually, that doesn't really make sense because if Harvard cares about that mission, it probably also cares about society generally. So really what it has to think to itself is, will we, you know, if, if ExxonMobil makes bigger profit and we're richer, we can use that to have a few less well off, more well, uh, a few more poorer people at Harvard. That's good. But at the same time, ExxonMobil may be um, increasing its carbon footprint in the process and actually uh, creating, you know, a warmer planet. And that's bad. And we need to actually compare those two things. It might be reason, you know, we can't just put on our money hat in one and just you know it, it completely ignore the social consequences so uh, that's my answer i hope it does it, is that clear yes mm -hmm. there is no so, dichotomy there is no so people who are suggesting there is a dichotomy i think they are logically incorrect thank you uh yeah i think zach has a question yeah this is uh, a little different but i was curious if uh frozen money is caused from more often caused from bad investments or wars in countries? Like, can politics affect banks to uh, have their money often more frozen in the country where the war or recession is occurring? Or is it purely based on the investments of that company? So you'll have to say that again a bit more slowly. I'm not sure I really understood it. Can you give an example? Yeah, so a lot of companies in Russia, for example, their money was frozen even when they had good investments. So does this uh, freeze occur because they, they had bad investments or is it just because of the current status with the um, bad, bad nation economy and the war on other well, countries? Are you who froze them? Are you talking about um, Russia freezing them or they they I mean, oh, wait, sorry, one second. Hey, Dave, can I call you in five minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Should I try to answer that? I mean, the way I would answer the question, it's uh, I would perhaps answer a slightly different question, which is, um, I mean, if Russia imposes, it freezes something, then the company can't do anything about it. So there's nothing really to talk about there. But I think the more relevant thing is, uh, you know, some companies have exited from Russia. Um, and that's very interesting. I have a student uh, working on that, actually, but a lot of people have worked on this. So one question is, are they exiting um, because that maximizes shareholder value? So are, are they taking the view, uh, we, you know, we're profit maximizers and the profit maximizing thing to do is to exit Russia. Why? Because if we don't, um, we go, they, a lot of people are going to be annoyed with us, including consumers, and they won't buy our product. And maybe uh, some of our workers will be annoyed with us and they'll quit. And so just for pure profit maximization reasons, it makes sense for us to exit from Russia, even though we had a profitable operation in, in Russia. That's one, you know, McDonald's exited, and maybe uh, that was the reason. But the other possibility is that actually they're, exiting that knowing that that might reduce profit long run profit and even uh, their market value but the ceo thinks it's the right thing to do um we don't really know yet which of those forces is at work and i people are still trying to work it out my own view by the way would be that ceos should be consulting their own shareholders this is my the whole uh, point of this talk really is to say that companies should be finding out the kinds of trade-offs that their own investors, um, not the, the institutions, but the people behind the institution, um, you know, they should be asking them, okay, exiting from Russia is going to uh, hit the bottom line a bit, hurt the bottom line, but um, maybe by doing that, we show our moral, you know, repugnance uh, about the war, and also we may even have an effect on, on Putin, and maybe a good effect, it could also be a bad effect, of course, we don't know, but are you willing to make that kind of trade-off, as opposed to the CEO making the decision themselves. That's my view. 
Thank you, Professor Hart. Um, so just be mindful of time. Uh, we are after five. Does anyone have any remaining questions? Uh, yeah, I have another one regarding uh, the paper that you we were talking about today. Yeah. So um, in your presentation, you talked about three different ways that currently, or also three different examples in which current firms or like ETFs have engaged users or their their buyers to um, become or like to take in their more like socially responsible options. So when we look at like the, I guess the world of public policy, um, something similar to kind of what Zunian was saying, but when we look at the world of public policy, what's something that you might see in the next 10 years um, that would allow more and more of these companies to shift from their current, um, their current status Ah, to something that's better. Yes, yes. Okay, that's very good. I'm glad you asked that. And maybe that's what Zunian had in mind, and I didn't answer it. But let me answer it now. There are lots of things that can happen. Um, first of all, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, which kind of polices these a lot of this activity. So, um, you know, uh, they they act as a gatekeeper for shareholder resolutions, and they sometimes allow companies to exclude them. So, you know, the the, share, the resolutions I talked about that got major, majority support, um, you know, towards the end of the slides, uh, DuPont and ExxonMobil and Duke Energy and all that, they were all opposed by management. And sometimes when management doesn't like a resolution, they can get the SEC to um, allow them to exclude it. So I think the SEC can become um, uh, more tolerant of resolutions, particularly in other uh, to 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 let more resolutions through. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing I think, which is very would be very important, is but this is going to be harder, is to actually change. Um, the way courts interpret fiduciary duty. So as I as I mentioned, um, the, the sort of incumbent view is that fiduciary duty means um, that I am maximizing um, your long run financial return. Um, well, this could change. The courts could take a different view and uh, the pension law could be changed so that someone who asks, uh, so, you know, right now, if, if I was managing pension money and I there was some shareholder resolution and I thought voting for it, let's say it's the incineration thing, right? And I thought that voting for incineration would reduce financial return. Um, I, I could not ask my investors, what would you like me to do? Even if a majority, even if a super majority said to me, you're managing our pension money, we would like you to vote for incineration, right? I would not be able to vote that way because I could be sued by the minority who would say I'm violating their fiduciary duty as um, the law understands it. That's the current situation, which would make me quite nervous about voting for anything other than no incineration, right? Well, I think that's crazy and that could be changed. I think it should be changed. That's going to take some time. But these things would make it easier for people to take into account um, non-monetary things. So I, that's that's. Thank you. Answer. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, well, just yeah, it's, it's already five oh seven. So th this was a wonderful discussion, and thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Hart, and sharing your perspective on social responsibility. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Have a great day. See thank you. you. Stay well. Bye. Thank you.